We've heard the reading of God's word. Let us now particularly give attention to uh, the passage that was read from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, uh, chapter 5, and uh, uh, verse 21 I particularly have in mind where the apostle uh, tells his readers and us uh, to test everything. And uh, our passage in in Deuteronomy 13 was connected to this. Uh, The simple fact is we're we're not to believe everything we hear, but we have the duty of testing everything. Now, the last few weeks when I have been with you, uh, I've been talking about the importance of a person deciding what are they going to do about Jesus Christ. uh, and uh, what are we to believe about Jesus, how are we to follow him. And, and indeed, I have had in mind particularly the position of the person who has not yet come to faith in Christ. And Jesus challenges every person. Uh, who do you say that I am? Will you follow me? Uh, the need to think deeply about the claims of Jesus Christ and to make the decision to be a disciple of Christ. Now, what I want to go on to say today uh, is that the same kind of thing is also required uh, of believers. If you are a Christian, you have decided to follow Christ uh, and you've begun uh, conscious discipleship of Christ. Well, out of this passage from the Apostle Paul, Uh, how I would express it is it's therefore vital, indeed it's a Christian duty, uh, that we must think for ourselves. Uh, When we become a Christian, that does not relieve us of the burden of having to think and judge and discern and to work out our Christian convictions. That's what Paul is telling us here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, uh, Test everything, hold fast to what is good. In other words, uh, a Christian must not uncritically just accept whatever he or she hears, you know, whatever happens to be spoken in church or or something like that. Uh, There is the call here for us to show uh, discernment for us to think and consider, indeed to judge and to weigh the things we hear, the things we're taught, and for us to, as Paul says, to test everything. In other words, we're not to believe everything that comes from the lips of a sincere, well-meaning believer. Someone might be converted, indeed sincere, godly, But that does not prevent a person also having a a lot of kooky ideas. Indeed, I've met many Christians in that condition. In in other words, everything that a brother or sister in Christ tells us to do or recommends that we think, uh, we're not simply to uh, accept what others say. Uh, Rather, the apostle is telling us to show Christian discernment. He says, test everything Hold fast to what is good. And in the same way, we're not to believe uh, anything just because the minister says it. That would be to treat our minister as a priest or a guru or an oracle. uh, And we're not to do that. Uh, Yes, uh, he's studied the Bible. He may have qualifications. He's got training. He's got a calling, he might have letters after his name or or whatever. And yet none of that gives a person the right to be heard uncritically. Uh, Rather, the apostle is telling us uh, that we need to test everything. Uh, Really what I'm talking about is the old Protestant doctrine of the right of private judgment. We're not to believe something just because the church says it or a minister says it or even a priest says it. 
Uh, indeed, it's not just the right of public uh, of private judgment; it's the duty, the responsibility of private judgment. As the Apostle Paul says here, indeed, it is phrased as a command, as an instruction to us all: test everything, hold fast to what is good. And so every Christian needs to judge for themselves when they're hearing something presented as Christian truth, is this really God's truth? Notice the apostle in our passage here, he doesn't say, believe everything. No, we're not to swallow everything that our minister may say or what we read in the latest uh, popular Christian book, but we're to test the things that we hear or read. It's not a, it's not a Christian way of thinking uh, to say, uh, well, I believe such and such is true because so and so says so. That, that's not how we should be developing our Christian convictions. Uh, that's just a case of uh, us being naive. And as Christian people, we can be terribly innocent, can't we? We want to believe others. We don't want to be judgmental. We don't want to be kind of difficult kind of people. We, we want to be humble. We want to be open. Of course we do. Let's be all that. And yet let's also do what the apostle says here to test everything. It is possible for us to be too trusting. Now we need to exercise judgment and we need to exercise discernment. Uh, let's look at a couple of other passages uh, where, where the same thing is, in effect, says, said. Uh, Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm thinking of Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. What does he say? And maybe he's got uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13 in his mind. I quote, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, are ravening wolves. You know, there are wolves in the church. We need to be discerning. We don't believe just anyone who comes along saying anything. No, we need to test everything. Paul himself, in Acts chapter 20, his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders, he uses this same frightening metaphor of, of wolves. Uh, I quote, uh, it's chapter 20, verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from your own selves will arise men speaking perverse things. He's speaking to the leadership of the Ephesian church. And, and, and where does he say these wolves might come from? From among you, from the very leadership of the church. So we're not thinking of just dangerous, mistaken, or even heretical ideas that come in from the world. No, no, these are dangers that are generated within the life of the church. And that's why we are indeed instructed to test everything. And no true minister takes it as an insult uh, when we do this. No, no real minister of God wants you just to believe everything he says just because he himself has said, said so. Now, he's claiming to get this teaching out of the Bible and what every minister wants is for the people of God to, to say to themselves, well, that's what he says. Now, let me see if I can find it in, in my Bible uh, as well. And uh, that's the very thing that uh, these uh, New Christians in, in Thessalonica, they've got the word of God. Indeed, they've got this letter from the Apostle Paul that is part of the word of God. The Apostle is said, saying, use these things to test everything. In other words, the scriptures are our final court of appeal. See, you might be saying to yourself, well, well, how am I supposed to be able to do that? I'm just a normal Christian. How am I supposed to be able to test things? and to know whether things are right or not, well, we have the scriptures in our hands. See, this is our guide. This is our uh, measure. Uh, Bishop J.C. Ryle, he put it like this, I quote, 
weigh everything in the balance of the Bible. The Bible is our balance. The Bible is our measure. Test everything by the Bible. That's our chief means by which we can obey this instruction to test everything. The Bible is our final court of appeal. I love the old Scripture Union motto. It was drawn from Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How can I know the path of Christian discipleship? God's word is that light. We're to use the word of God to test everything that claims to be a word from God. That's the point the apostle is making, test everything. We're not to take the lazy way, and indeed it's the dangerous way, uh, to just leave it to the minister or leave it to other Christians to read and study the Bible for us. We're not to do that. But we're to read the Bible ourselves and to pray over what we read. I don't know if you've read the lovely Christian books for children written by Patricia St. John, but in one of her books she talks about her own father uh, who had a profound knowledge of the Bible. Uh, any chapter or verse of the Bible, if it was quoted to him, he would be able to say exactly where it came from, chapter and verse. And after a meeting where he was speaking, a lady came up to him and said to him, uh, Mr. St. John, I'd give the world to know the Bible as you do. And he replied to this lady, Madam, that's just what it costs. It'll cost you the world. In other words, we need to give up some of our worldly pursuits, pleasures and interests if we're going to become acquainted with God's word. How can we, ordinary believers, how can we know the Bible well enough so that we can use it to test and to discern the things we hear, the things we're taught? Well, maybe we have to watch a bit less TV and go to a few more, a few less sporting games or spend less time shopping or, you know, I mean, like there's a cost to be paid. But we need to know our Bible and we need to use it uh, to test everything. Now, am I, what I'm saying here, is this really entirely unpractical? Uh, am I really expecting too much of the average Christian? Well, let me just say a couple of things to, to affirm you. I trust empower you that, yes, you can use the scriptures to test everything. Well, let, let's first of all realise what, what do we have here in the Bible? In other words, the character of scripture. The Bible is not written in technical language. Uh, think of the Old Testament. Most of the Old Testament is stories, and in the case of the Psalms and some of the prophets, it's poetry. Uh, it's not written as a scientific textbook or a theological essay. Uh, in other words, everyone who loves a good story can read and understand the Bible for themselves. And even those parts of the Bible that sometimes people say are difficult... And remember, even, even the Apostle Peter in his second letter said that the Apostle Paul wrote some things difficult to understand. And yet I, I love the title that J.B. Phillips gave to his translation of Paul's letters. This was a popular translation that came out in the 1950s and 60s. What did he call his book? Uh, letters to Young Churches. Just think about this for a moment. Uh, these Christians in Thessalonica who have received this letter of the Apostle Paul, as far as we can judge, he probably wrote this letter to them only a few weeks after the church had been founded and they had been converted. They're young Christians. Indeed, they're baby Christians. And yet he expects them, using the scripture, and indeed using his letter, which is part of scripture, these young Christians, he is expecting them to be able to test everything. Well, if we've been a Christian longer than a few weeks, we really have no excuse. We've got the Bible. We're expected to be reading it and studying it. And that's our chief means of testing 
everything. So I don't believe for a moment that what I'm saying here is some kind of counsel of perfection. And indeed, we can't get around this instruction, test everything. And can I remind you of one other thing that you know already? That if you're a Christian, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who inspired and dictated the Word of God lives in you, assisting you as you read and ponder the things that you find in the Bible. The way the Apostle Paul expresses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he talks about uh, spirit, uh, speaking spiritual things to spiritual people. If you're a Christian, you're a spiritual person, you understand spiritual truths. Or to put it another way, the things we read in the Bible, the Bible's read, talking about things that you know by personal experience. And indeed, the best commentary on the Bible is personal experience. The Bible talks about sin. Well, you and I know about sin. We face the fact of sin in our lives. The Bible talks about repentance. Well, we've done that and we continue to do that regularly. The Bible talks about forgiveness. We know the forgiveness of God. See what I'm saying? What the Bible is talking about things that you know about from personal experience. So we have the Bible in our hands. We have God's spirit in our hearts and minds. We are equipped to do what the apostle says here, to test everything. In other words, we need to use the brains that God has given us as Christians and to be discerning. Well, that's what I'm saying from the word of God, seeking to take up and apply the apostle's word. Finally, can I just say a couple of things to remind you of what I'm not saying? What am I not saying? I'm not encouraging the person who seldom reads the Bible but sets themselves up to pick holes in every sermon their poor minister preaches. Maybe you know the kind of person who, uh, whatever, whatever the minister said, this person's at the, at the door of the church, collaring the minister and pointing out what he should have said or didn't say or he said it the wrong way. And I, I'm not encouraging that kind of difficult, judgmental attitude. Uh, I, I, indeed, it's usually the case that those who know least think they know the most. I teach in a theological college, and, I, and uh, what I could say is it's interesting uh, that the first years know more than the fourth years, or at least they think they do. See, we can be overconfident, can't we? Uh, we've got a little bit of Bible knowledge, and we think we know everything. Now, we need to be lifelong students of the Bible, so let's have a proper humility. I'm also not encouraging the person who has a few favourite texts or some kind of pet doctrine. It might be the love of God or it might be the doctrine of predestination. And then they use this kind of uh, their, their favourite you know, bit of Bible knowledge as some kind of Occam's razor to cut down and get rid of all the other things that the Bible says. And the problem they find with their minister is that he's not always riding their hobby horse. Now, I'm not trying to encourage that kind of illegitimate criticism either. But we do need to think for ourselves, and we need to test everything that we hear from the Bible. Also, I'm not promoting originality for its own sake. It's a dangerous thing for us to set out to be original. This is kind of like the PhD trap, isn't it? Someone's studying something for a doctorate and they're trying to find something amazingly unique that no one else has thought about. There is the danger, isn't it? They're going to find out, they're going to discover something that doesn't even exist. It's just in their head. You see, we can be an original thinker in the wrong kind of way. And that's often where heresies in the church have started. Someone's wanted, wanted to come up with some kind of bright idea of themselves that no one's ever thought of. Well, that's dangerous ground, isn't it? In art, it's a compliment, isn't it? How original. 
And indeed, cheekily, I could say, you know, about modern arts, so often, uh, you know, isn't it amazing? Who would ever have thought to paint something that looks like that? See, like, originality is not always something that is good. So I'm not trying to encourage the wrong kind of uh, uh, originality. You've thought up all these wonderful and clever ideas, but they're not from the Bible, they're from your own head. I'm not encouraging that. The apostle is not encouraging that when he says, test everything. Now, we're not to be opinionated. We're not to find fault with others just because, oh, we've got some other idea. Uh, it's like the person who says, my opinions may have changed, but not the fact that I'm always right. You know, you know the kind of thing that I'm <laughs> suggesting here. No, where to be humble, where to be teachable, where, where to be open to the teaching of our pastors, our leaders within the church. But we're not to swallow everything people say, and we are to test everything. Now, of course, this right duty of private judgment can be abused, and I've listed some of the ways it can be abused. But that's the same for every good gift of God, isn't it? So, so don't let the fact that people may abuse this right and Christian freedom, don't let that cause you to overreact and say, therefore, oh, the safest thing is just to believe whatever my minister or whatever uh, I find in, in some kind of Christian book. Uh, remember at the Reformation, the argument of the Catholic Church was that the Bible was too dangerous to put into the hands of ordinary people. They just had to listen to the priest. And yet uh, matches are dangerous, as are cars, as is electricity, as is money. They're all dangerous, but we need them. We use them. We have a right to use them. And, and so there's a Christian right and duty using the Bible with God's spirit in our hearts and minds for us to be discerning and to test everything and to hold fast to what is good. Let's pray. Yes, God, our, our Father, there, there just seems to be dangers everywhere. On, on, on one side, Lord, we face the danger of being uh, too individualistic and judgmental. Uh, on the other hand, we face the danger of being gullible and, and swallowing everything that people say. Please, Lord, there's a Christian middle road. Help us to take that path. Help us to do what the Apostle Paul is instructing us to do, to teach everything. And Lord, we thank you that there is faithful teaching in the church. But Lord, help each one of us to exercise that responsibility. Whatever we hear, whatever is presented as gospel truth, Lord, please make, enable it to be our regular habit, our reflex, to go to the word of God and to test and to weigh the things that we have heard. Keep us on that true way that we may believe what we should and, and live out uh, our discipleship of Christ faithfully, intelligently, and we pray all this in our Saviour's name. Amen. Thank you for your time with us. Let me close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.